Christmas time, we always, uh, at least I, always think back on previous Christmases, and I even think all the way back to childhood, and I think a lot about my mom and my dad and just how we did things and all that. And one of the things that I always remember, you know, because we always read Matthew 1, we meet, read Luke 2, uh, my dad was raised in Virginia, my mom was raised in uh, Washington State, and you know, in high school, both of them were required in school to memorize Matthew 1 and Luke 2. They had to memorize the Christmas story. And, uh, you know, I thought that's just kind of an amazing thing. I don't think they do that anymore. But, uh, uh, you know, and my dad, he just loved to talk about Christmas and he loved to talk to people about Jesus. And uh, at Christmas time in particular, he loved to go up to people just to be able to start a spiritual conversation. And he'd say, now Christmas, it's, it's about Jesus, right? And they're like, oh yeah, yeah, it's Jesus' birth. And then he'd say, hey, where, where in the Bible, if I wanted to read about that, where in the Bible would I go? And you know, in the city I was raised in, even though they were very, very religious people, uh, most of them did not have a clue as to where you go. I mean, they'd say, what's well, at the beginning? You know, it's, it's gotta be there in Genesis somewhere. <laughs> you know, that, that's the first book. And they just didn't know where it was. Well, the Christmas story is told in several places. It's told in Matthew 1, and it's told in Luke 2. And I read for us one of the Christmas stories that Paul told. That's Philippians 2. Today we're going to look at another one that uh, you may not often think about. We're going to look at the Christmas story as the Apostle John told it in Revelation 12. Revelation 12. If you've got a Bible, or if you're using your phone, I want you to turn with me to Revelation 12. This is going to be uh, a little bit different Christmas story than I think we're all used to, you know, because we always think of Christmas as this you know sweet little time you know you got a baby in a manger you got shepherds in the field you got you know a star in the sky and wise men on camels and uh you know a, a stable full of all these you know mooing animals went to any what mother would not want a cow in her labor and delivery room you know uh it's just this quaint little story but you know matthew he tells us the Christmas story from Joseph's perspective, and Luke tells us the Christmas story from Mary's perspective. You know what? When John tells it in Revelation 12, it's told from heaven's perspective. And so what I want to do uh, with our time today is just look at how John tells the story here kind of the behind the scenes thing that God revealed to him and then I just want to close by just pulling out some so what's out of it like we always like to do just so we can see some really practical things as we're really we're winding down 2023 and getting ready to kickstart 2024 um, now if you're tracking with us, you know, over the last couple months, you know, we started a series on the book of Revelation. and We've been walking through it, but we haven't gotten to chapter 12 yet, so I'm skipping ahead. But just so that you can pay attention, when you get to chapter 12, there's kind of a, a parenthesis. It's like John has been telling the vision that he'd been seeing up there in heaven, and then... He gets to uh, this section, and he just kind of pauses in the storytelling and fills in some of the gaps, some of the information that God provided for him to, uh, to uh, make this vision make a lot of sense. And so chapter 12 is kind of like, hey, here is what really Advent was all about. The coming of Jesus Christ was all about. And so he tells it uh, from that perspective. So look at chapter 12, verse 1. And I'm just going to uh, uh, punch ahead here a little bit just to help you as I read it. I'm going to go ahead because this is a, a vision. And uh, initially, if you don't know these things right off the top of, uh, uh, from the beginning, it, it gets a little hard to, to, uh, to understand. 
But the woman we're going to see here, it's not, not the Virgin Mary. It, it's actually Israel. It's the nation of Israel, the people of Israel. It's the physical, literal descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's Israel, okay? And the dragon is Satan. In fact, the, uh, you know, later in the, ver in the passage, it tells us that Satan, that the devil, the accuser of the brethren, and the child that's being born, obviously, is Christ, Jesus, okay? So let me just read it for you, okay? Uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. And again, like I said, we're jumping way ahead in where we are in our study of Revelation, and we're just kind of in a, a part where it's like a parenthesis. Lots of judgments have happened, horrible things have happened here on earth. And then... John gives us a couple chapters of behind-the-scenes stuff. He says, and, I, and a great sign appeared in the heavens. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars. And she was with child, and she cried out, being in labor and in pain, to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on its head, and ten horns on his, and on his head were seven diadems. And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth, he might devour the child. And she gave birth to a son, a male son, a male child, who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up or snatched up or raptured up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God so that there she might be nourished for 1,260 days. And there was war in, in heaven. Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon and the dragon and his angels waged war and they were not strong enough and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven and the great da da dragon was thrown down thrown down out of heaven the serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world he was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come, for the accuser of their brethren has been thrown down who accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcome him. They overcome him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony and... Because they did not love their life even unto death. So for this reason, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman. Who gave birth to the male child, and the two wings, and the, and the two wings of the great e of a great eagle were given to the woman, in order that she might fly into the wilderness, to her place where she was nourished for a time and times and a half a time, from the presence of the serpent, and the serpent poured water like like a river, out of his mouth after the woman, so that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. And the earth helped. The earth helped the woman. The earth opened its mouth and drank up the river which the dragon poured out to his mouth, poured out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her offspring who kept the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of of Jesus. Now I've told you there's a lot of these visions, you know, are wild visions. They're hard to understand. Lots of symbolism in them, and 
It's a lot like the dreams that we've had, and I've already, as we've studied through Romans, I've told you about some of the dreams I've had and how wild and freaky they were. I'm not going to do that today, but you understand, okay, uh, what's going on here. But at the same time, those dreams have meaning. They have significance, and, uh, you know, even though we may not be able to figure out anything and all of the things in them and all of the details in them, we can generally get the picture. Now, like I already said, the woman that is about to have a baby, she represents, I think, Israel. See back at verse 1? She represents the, the literal physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remember way back to Genesis 37? You know, since all of you are going to read the Bible through in a year, uh, you'll probably start with Genesis 1 tomorrow, and so probably by, you know third week you'll be in genesis 37 you're going to read about joseph remember joseph the guy with the technicolor coat he had dreams about how he how he was what of of his future and one of the dreams he had was about his family and he talked about there was the sun and the moon and the stars and all that stuff it's almost like the image same imagery is going on here and that's kind of one of the ways we identify this woman as with Israel. She's clothed with the sun, the moon at her feet. She's got a crown with 12 stars around her. And she's about to give birth to a child. And notice there at the end of verse 2, it says well, she's in great labor. And any of us that have ever observed that process, we know that that is great labor. Lots of pain, lots of turmoil, lots of suffering, if you will. She is about to give birth. Well, Everyone, you know, when we sit and think about it, okay, it's like here is Israel, and, and if we wanted to put it in the Christmas story, it's like the Virgin Mary, you know, she was kind of this representative of, of the nation that is giving birth to the Messiah, because that's who the child is. He's going to be this one that ultimately will rule with a rod of iron, just like it says in Psalm 2 about the Messiah nations are raging and he laughs because he's going to rule with the rod of iron and uh, so here is mary about to give birth to a child where everyone's excited everyone's happy the shepherds are out in the fields you know hearing the announcement from the from the angels and they come running to worship and the wise men they've been traveling for months trying to get there to see the place everyone responds great Except for who? Satan. How does the dragon, how did Satan respond to the advent of Jesus Christ? Well, he didn't like it, did he? See verse 3? Another sign appeared in the heavens, and behold, there was a great red dragon. Maybe he's red, you know, because red so, sometimes tends to... to symbolize blood and lots of death he's got seven heads and ten horns you know i'm not really sure what the seven heads are about or the ten horns about we know we've seen already you know that number seven's kind of that that you know complete number there's seven days in the week you know there's seven jewish holidays that they celebrate the hornox had seven kids it's, it's just the perfect number you know this completion I don't really know, but Satan is, is, is here pictured as a dragon who has is, is got a lot of power. He's got seven diadems on his head. I mean, he's got a lot of authority. And I think that's something we often forget is God has given Satan or allowed Satan to have incredible authority. We often think about the temptations of Jesus when Satan appeared to him and tempted him and you know, we, sometimes if, we, if we're not in the know, we say, you know, what? he's offering him the kingdoms of the world. Satan has the kingdoms of the earth. God in his sovereignty is allowing Satan to rule right now. That's a legitimate offer to Jesus. If Jesus would have bowed down to Satan, he could have the, author, the kingdoms of the world. Satan's got plenty of authority. He's got seven diadems. You know, it's just... He's got that authority because of who he is. Verse 4 says, His tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven. Maybe you've seen this before. A lot of people, 
lot of theologians through the centuries have thought, well, maybe this is referring to when Satan fell long before uh, Adam and Eve, maybe when Satan fell, stars often in the Bible are referring to angels. Perhaps this is referring to the fact that when Satan fell and rebelled against God and said in his heart, I want to be like God, because he as an angel, a created being, was one of the highest angels, perhaps one of the leading angels, maybe the most uh, brilliant of all God's angels. And uh, a third of the angels went with him. Perhaps that's where demons come from. Demons are just fallen angels, angels that sided with Satan in that incredible rebellion that occurred before Genesis 1 even. Several passages tell us about it. Maybe that's what verse 4 is about. His tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she gave birth, he might devour her child. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Just like Psalm 2 speaks about the Messiah ruling the nations. And we know what happened. Christ grew up, took on the sins of the world, died on the cross, was raised from the dead. Forty days later, he ascended back into heaven. Why? Because he had come preaching, his forerunner had come preaching, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, it's here. But rather than taking the king of the kingdom and putting him on a throne, they put him on a cross. And so Jesus left, went back to heaven with the promise, I will come again, even right before he ascended into heaven. The ascension of Jesus is really a significant event in his life because when he ascended into heaven, he went victoriously because he had purchased salvation, he had accomplished the mission, but the kingdom had not been accepted not rege- uh, by, by humankind. And Jesus left, and the disciples said, well, is it now that you're going to restore the kingdom? And he said, no, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons. I'm going, but I will come back. That's all in Acts chapter 1. And so it must be that maybe that's what that's referring to, that the child was snatched up to heaven, and that's where he is. And so what does the, the dragon do? He can't touch Jesus, because Jesus is up in heaven. So he turns his attention towards the woman, towards the mother, towards Israel. That's what this vision's all about. Verse 5, she gave birth to a son, the male child, who was to rule the nations with the rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Jesus is there, seated at the right hand of the Father. Seated, he's there. The only time we know he ever got up out of his chair was when he welcomed Stephen, the first martyr, one of the first martyrs. He stood there and he welcomed him in. And the woman, what happened to her? Verse 6, she fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God that she would be protected so that she might be nourished for 1,260 days. Now, I've told you, since we're going through the book of Revelation, and have been going through it, one of the things we're going to do you know, later in January or first part of February is I'm going to take a Sunday night to kind of put all this stuff together. So I'm not going to deal with it a lot right now. But essentially, just to to fast forward to that and just kind of summarize what's going on here, what I think is going on here is that this is referring to a time in the tribulation, and it ties into that 70th week of Daniel. If you don't understand that, just plan on coming in a few weeks when we do that, and I'll try to make it more clear. But if you do understand it, I think this is referring to the events of the 70th week of Daniel, the tribulation, the great tribulation. It refers here to 12,060 days. By the way, that's a a three-and-a-half-year span. 
Later it calls it time, times, and a half a time. That's kind of a single, a simple plural, which is two, one, two, and a half. That all adds up to three and a half, three and a half years, 1260 days, all of that stuff. And it's almost like that, that everything's going along great for the people of Israel. But about halfway through that 70th year, 70th week, just like Daniel prophesied back in Daniel 9, that peace treaty that allowed them to enjoy great peace and prosperity was broken, and they had to flee for their lives. And all of a sudden, they became the target. Why? Because Satan hates the people of God. He hates Christ, but he hates the people of God as well. And here is Israel needing to flee. And the rest of the passage goes on to talk about how God rescued his people. Now, that's just a real quick summary of what it is we've, we're seeing here. And you can kind of read through it a little bit more. I mean, you know, verse 7 incredible warfare going on between Michael and uh, the angels that he's leading and in the process Satan gets kicked out of heaven you say well Satan didn't he get kicked out of heaven before creation even no not really remember the book of Job if you read the Bible through in a year you'll read the book of Job uh, and I guarantee you you will understand you, you will you will see things in there you probably have never thought about before. But in the first two chapters of Job, we find out that Satan is in God's presence, accusing you, accusing me. And in that case, he was accusing Job. That's why it says here that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. He's still in God's presence. But at some point in the future, I think at the midway point of, of the Great Tribulation, he's kicked out, finally, finally kicked out of heaven no longer allowed to come into god's presence and that enrages him even more so he can't take it out on christ he can't take it out on god so who's he going to take it out on he's going to take it out on god's people in this instance he's taking it out on israel and he chases them out and that's what i think the rest of the passage is all about so that's christmas from john's perspective from heaven's perspective we don't read that normally on uh, Christmas morning. We like to stick to Luke 2 and Luke Matthew 1. But maybe the Sunday after Christmas, it's good for us to think about it because there's some really key things here for us to get. Now, if you didn't track with me on all of that explanation, that's okay. Uh, here's, what, here's what I really want you to get out of it, okay? Here's the so what. And I just want to share with you four so what's. Because they're all very important. We are at war. We are at war. I, I think so many times we do not recognize that we are in the midst of a war that makes World War I and World War II and Vietnam and Desert Storm and all the other things that have happened since then in, in the last 30 years. They, they, they pale in comparison to the spiritual war that we are in. We have an adversary, the devil, Satan, who regularly is accusing us to God. Fortunately, we have, according to uh, 1 John 2, verse 1, we've got an advocate, a lawyer, a good lawyer, standing in front of God, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he's reminding Satan and God the Father that he has made propitiation. He's paid for our sins, but Satan is still accusing us. We're in a war, and it's a vicious war. And if you read through this passage, and if you paid attention as I read it, I mean, Satan is vicious. He has come to kill, steal, and destroy. And I think one of the things about us believers is sometimes we just kind of fall asleep at the will and we don't recognize how absolutely dangerous the times are. I mean, my friends, we, got, we, we, we have to so pursue Jesus Christ 
because Satan is gunning for us. And yes, we are clothed in Jesus' righteousness. We've got the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, and all these things. But my goodness, even Michael the archangel, not in this passage, but in the book of uh, Jude, when he was doing war with Satan, he said, the Lord rebuke you. He himself didn't even feel like he had the credentials to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Satan. I mean, sometimes, you know, it's really sad because as believers, it's like we, we just kind of cavalierly think of them. And, of course, we're living in a society that, you know, takes a vision like this and turns Satan into a caricature that, you know, he's not all that anything to worry about anyway. Truth of the matter is, we are at war. You know, I think, I may be wrong on this, but uh, I think that as far as approval ratings, George W. Bush had some absolutely incredible approval ratings in the days and weeks and months after 9-11, you know, 22 years ago. September 11th, the planes crash into the towers, the Pentagon, and and uh, President Bush just really rose to the occasion. The nation came together. We were unified, and all of a sudden, the most important thing came was we've got to defeat the enemy. And, uh, you know, I think historians even now are saying Bush, Bush did, it, what, did well in that time. And I, I don't know exactly why he did so well, but I think one of the things was what actually happened immediately remember where President Bush was when the planes flew into the towers? He was reading a storybook to some elementary children in a little class, uh, school in Florida. So here's President Bush. He's got all these little, I don't know, let's say third graders, and he's reading them a story. And Andy Card had already told him one plane flew into a tower. Well, probably an accident. But then, halfway through the story, Andy Card comes over and whispers in his ear, and he says, a second plane flew into the other tower. Do you remember what the first thing Bush said was? He said, we are at war. I think one of the reasons President Bush did so well in those months, right after that, was he, he immediately recognized we're at war. I think one of the reasons we as believers sometimes get our rear ends kicked spiritually is because we don't recognize that we're at war. I mean, do you realize there is an adversary, an enemy, who is gunning for your marriage, who is gunning for the hearts and souls of your children, your grandchildren, who, who would just love for you to discredit yourself in this community so that who cares what you believe? Who cares who you know? Who cares that you think you're going to heaven because of what Jesus did for you? I mean, you are in a war, and you've got a target on your front, on your back. And, and we have to recognize that. Now, let me just share with you a couple others, and they're, they're kind of related, but... Uh, Here's the second one. Satan absolutely hates what Jesus came to do. I mean, why was Satan ready to devour the child? And one of the most obvious ways he did it was he enraged Herod and tried to kill off all the babies in Bethlehem. But I'm sure there were many, many other attempts on Christ's life. You know, I was thinking about the, the manger scene here we got. Wouldn't it have been great if I could have figured out some way to have a dr dragon on top of it? Because that's really what the vision was. I mean, Satan wanted to kill Jesus Christ. Why? Because he wanted to keep Jesus Christ from the cross. Because if he can keep the cross out of the picture, he keeps Jesus Christ off of the throne, ultimately. I mean, it's huge. And if you sit and read through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which hopefully you'd get through by about April if you'll read the Bible through in a year, 
you know and by the way you can get it for 17 bucks on Amazon it'd probably be at your house by Tuesday um, if you will do that you you could read through Matthew Mark Luke and John and be done by April and and if you'll read it with that that perspective you will see that almost ev at every turn Satan or some agent of Satan is trying to keep Jesus from making his appointment with the cross. He hates it. Jesus Christ does not, or Satan does not want the cross. And ever since the cross, because he can't go back and rewrite history or undo history, he's tried to eclipse the cross and make the cross something that is irrelevant. You know, people don't like a bloody salvation. People don't like that it's you know we'd rather talk about how we're saved by the love of God as opposed to the sacrifice of Christ Satan hates the cross and that's one of the things he's doing in the war here's something else he's doing in the war he is persecuting the faithful now in this passage yes this is specifically about how he is at some point in the future going to really unleash his terror against to believe the physical literal descendants of Abraham Isaac and Jacob which he's done many many times throughout history I think it's kind of what we're seeing in the last three months just another illustration of Satan wanting to extinguish the people of God the the literal physical descendants of Abraham Isaac and Jacob who who as the book of Romans talks about they're the conduit through which salvation came because they're the conduit through which Jesus came they're the conduit through which the Word of God came I mean and here they are and now yes they they, they may have Abraham Isaac and Jacob's blood in their veins but many of them in fact most of them don't have the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob in their hearts so in reality, they, with all due respect, they're pagans, they're unbelievers, many of them are just avowed atheists, but they are still the physical, literal descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and God has a plan for them to bring them their king that they rejected 2,000 years ago. And what is Satan regularly trying to do? He's trying to persecute them, he's trying to eliminate them, and I think you can look at history and see that that whole movement of anti-Semitism that, that arises every once in a while, that's all just satanic, you know? Here they are, they're people that, that really just have the blood of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but they, Satan knows that someday they will have their eyes open. And the blinders released, as Romans 9, 10, and 11 talks about. But you know, that is kind of the primary application of this passage. But you know what? Satan is always after God's faithful. Okay, Romans 12 isn't about us, I don't believe. Some people do. They have the right to be wrong. But in, well, it's just sorry. <laughs> but, but Satan is always gunning for God's people. When you trusted Jesus Christ as personal Savior, and when I trusted Jesus Christ as personal Savior, we became the enemy of Satan. That's why it's so devastating when we don't even realize we're in a war. No wonder we're getting beat up sometimes, because we don't realize there's someone else in the ring punching at us. That is what Satan does. Those times that you feel discouraged and depressed and and you know disunified with the, the the people of God that God has put in your life it's all work of Satan to to bring about he can't he can't steal our salvation no we're secure but he can make our lives as miserable and as ungodly as he or he, at least he's attempting to as much as he can He's trying to persecute you. He's after you. That's why, like Peter said in 1 Peter 5, 7, we've got to be sober, vigilant, because our adversary, the devil, goes around like a roaring lion, seeking to devour 
you. One last thing. This has all been kind of negative, but I'm going to end on the positive. Our hope is in Christ. See, the, the big picture is that Jesus wins. Yeah, this child is snatched up, and all hell breaks out on the mother, but the story ends with Christ's return. Chapter 19 tells about the child coming back. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. You know, I've been kind of interesting uh, to me. Uh, it seems to me like, you know, this whole fall, this whole second half of this last year, several of the messages, the sermons, if you've paid attention to them, it, it's like God has taken us back to the fact that our hope is in Jesus Christ. Remember, remember the series of sermons I did on, you know, what fellowship should be like or what we hope is our culture our vibe one of the things that we put in there is that we hope we desire that when someone comes to this place when they come and worship at this house they will say boy the people there they were hopeful in a discouraging world in a depressing world in a world that seems like it is doing anything and everything it can to run away from God those people have hope hope that things are going to turn around no hope that there is a God who is sovereign and compassionate and in control and secure and protects us that's our hope and that hope is not just in some political maneuver or in some thing that might arise or in our abilities or our gifting our hope is in Jesus Christ. That's why Satan is after him. Because Satan wants to discredit Jesus so he can crush your hope. The fact that you recognize Jesus is in control. He's in sovereign. Do you know him? I mean, do you know him personally? Have you come to that place in your life where you have trusted in this child who came and died on the cross in your place? You can't have hope without a reason to have that hope. And the reason for the hope is in the cross of Christ. Because when he died on the cross, he died for you in your place so that you could have a relationship with with the God of the universe. That's the hope we have. We don't have hope just because we're going to be optimistic people and it's better to be optimistic than pessimistic. We have hope because we have a God who is worth dying for. We have a God who is worth investing everything we have in. I love what verse 11 says talks about this war and he says these people they overcame why because of the blood of the lamb who died on the cross and because of the word of their testimony they really stuck with it but also look at that last one and they did not love their lives even to death they realized there was something worth pursuing and so they set their minds on things above not on things of the earth. You know, if you want to finish this year well and if you want to start this next year really well, read your Bible through in a year. <laughs> Have I emphasized that enough? But I just want, just, you know, I believe in it. You know, you guys can do whatever you want, but I believe in it. If you want to start this next year well, recognize that you have a God who is worth Worshiping and serving, even unto death. That's how these people saw it. It's the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and did not love their lives, even unto death. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for just the privilege of being able to uh, 
walk through this passage. And boy, we just skipped, touched the surface of it. But Father, I thank you that you have reminded us that once again, we're in a war. But Lord, we are on the, the side that has already won. Uh, the, the, it's settled. Satan just won't accept the terms and uh, accept defeat. And Father, we thank you for the victory that Jesus Christ won for us on, at the cross. And Lord, as we're living in this time when uh, that reality It's not all the way here, at least here on earth. And Satan is so alive and so active. Father, I pray for strength. I pray for hope. I pray for just the, the chance to really and truly uh, be all in with Jesus Christ. Father, we ask your forgiveness because I'm sure there are a lot of things we love. And uh, they just aren't worth loving more than you and so father i pray that today we would be your people going into uh, this community and into this next year just uh, all in for jesus christ our lord our savior our king.